that crucial moment. <laughs> it was me, I jinxed it. Do you want me to rehook? literally just working yeah. right let's try a different port okay that's it Thank you uh, to those of you who are joining us. Come on in. Um, you didn't miss anything. We just got the projector working. So thanks, everyone, for your patience. Um, this is my third year at DataCon LA. I keep wanting to call it Big Data Day LA, but we don't say that. It's DataCon LA. Um, this is my favorite, as I said in the keynote, this is my favorite uh, conference to go to. Uh, we have a regional data conference in Phoenix, where I'm from. Um, it's not nearly as big. It's also very cool, but it is, it is not on this scale. So um, this is a fantastic event that continues to grow year after year, and I'm super, I'm super glad to be here and um, just, just glad to be back. So um, I lead a team of developer advocates. We're all about developers and helping developers succeed. So um, not a sales guy. Uh, I love the tech, and, and so someone hired me to talk about it. and. Uh, these are good times. So uh, I've worked for um, a few companies. Um, thank you for, for the introduction. Um, I spent a lot of time in the defense industry and um, then made a crazy career choice and went and worked for a hotel company, having no background in that industry whatsoever. Um, but I started out as a Java developer and then um, gradually got further and further away from coding for my day job. Um, this was a mistake. Don't do this. So. Uh, about uh, almost three years ago, I had the opportunity to join DataSax and, co and go back. And I, I don't code full time, but that is a, big, a major part of what I do now. Um, so hopefully what I can bring, step, step forward, forward? yeah. So, oh, okay, so I won't block the slides. Good plan. We're friends now. <laughs> um, so a lot of what I get to do now is go out and talk to groups like this um, about using the technology, about being successful. I try to draw on my background in architecture and development um, to you know, share wisdom such as it is. Uh, you can be the judge. Uh, and also, uh, yeah, I, I wrote the um, second edition of the Cassandra book for O'Reilly. Uh, I am working on the third edition right now. And um, I thought it was going to be so easy. It, it's only been three years. It hasn't changed that much. Yeah, it has. Okay. Um, so uh, what you're going to get in here is a little bit of architectural patterns and ways of using technology. I also actually uh, want to talk a little bit up front about selecting infrastructure. This is not my secret um, Jedi mind tricks to get you to uh, adopt Cassandra. This is really about how do you make mature decisions uh, and, and make wise decisions when you're selecting technology. I mean, there are a number of cases where I may talk to somebody and say, Cassandra is probably not the right technology for your use case. That's OK. Um, but there are a number of use cases where it is the right technology. And so we'll talk about those. We'll talk about uh, where, where Kafka and Cassandra fit together. Um, and I, the baseline, where I'm coming from, is uh, uh, basically a microservice style architectures. That's kind of my bread and butter, what I do a lot of. Um, so we'll talk probably mostly about that from an architecture perspective. So let's rewind. Um, now, what I won't make any of you do is date yourselves by 
uh, saying whether or not you recognize this architectural pattern or not, because uh, funny enough, it's not an obsolete architectural pattern. Just because we've been architecting systems this way for many years doesn't mean, <laughs> uh, means that this is still around, I guess. So uh, this is the world that, that I kind of grew up in as a developer, where you had one uh, a series of, of monolithic applications that your organization maintained. Each of them had their own dedicated relational database that they were sitting on top of. Uh, and if, uh, if you knew the right guys, you could actually get access to that underlying database. Uh, but the, the one big monolithic app, uh, and we, we grew dependent on some things like having um, ACID transactions, and it meant that we could put data in any table that we wanted to at any time, gather data uh, with joins through any table that we wanted at any time. And if it didn't perform well, then we knew that we went to the DBA and got them to create the right index for us. Um, and then if we had other applications that wanted to uh, consume that data, um, a lot of times, did they hit an API? No, they did not. They went right to the database and grabbed the tables <laughs> right out from it. Who's seen this architecture? Come on. OK, you know what I'm talking about. OK, so let's talk about the, the API boom, right? So we, we have now we're going to get smarter about this. We're going to introduce APIs in front of uh, to kind of uh, you know, expose endpoints, let's say, from these monolithic ap applications. We're going to kind of wrap it or break off pieces of that monolith. Uh, using something called the strangler pattern, which sounds overly threatening to me. But we, we were going to basically uh, get around this problem of integration by database by providing APIs, and then the API would hide the database access. This is good progress. And then we started to put in, uh, we realized that that means that we don't have to use a relational database for everything. And in fact, if we have cases where we need massive scale, on top of these data sets, we can start using some of these newer databases that don't fit the old uh, relational database paradigm. So this is when these new, new SQL databases, uh, or uh, no, NoSQL and then new SQL databases came out. So like it's been probably over 10 years in this uh, NoSQL revolution. Um, I can't believe it's been that long already. But uh, now we have options, I guess is the point of this slide. So in, in uh, microservice architectures, we now have the ability to take these services. Uh, they're fine-grained. They do one thing. They control hopefully one data type. Uh, and we can deploy and scale them independently and put them in whatever clouds we want. So this is great. Um, this enables us to, I mean, should we have the need to have what we call a hybrid architecture where I have or a hybrid cloud architecture where I have my local data center, uh, and then I have maybe a, a data center from AWS cloud provider. I should have made this slide say US West 1, um, just to relate to the audience properly. I did not. Um, I uh, did the more abstract data center A. So uh, Cassandra happens to be a great technology for this kind of architecture uh, because of the fact that it's an open source technology. Obviously, you can buy an enterprise version from Datastax, but it's not tied to one particular cloud vendor. Um, so it scales nicely across that. Now, you can also do what might be called a, a multi-cloud kind of architecture. Um, notice here that I'm showing uh, I might have two AWS data centers that I'm synchronizing data to, but what if I also want to synchronize data to a different cloud provider? Maybe I'm using GCP. Maybe I want to have some of my data replicated by Cassandra over to another data center in GCP land so that I can take advantage of their great machine learning capabilities. That's best in class. Uh, so maybe I do most of my business workloads in Amazon, but I really want to take advantage of uh, machine learning capabilities in Google. I can use Cassandra to replicate my data quite easily to do that. So th there's a number of uh, interesting architectural um, techniques that you can use once you have kind of a microservice style architecture and once you're using a database that replicates across clouds. Uh, <clears throat> we have a great demo uh, of this, which um, hopefully, <laughs> if Alex got it set up, I, I think we may have a version of this demo that's running at our booth today. So we do have a, uh, a booth. Be happy to join you outside for a short conversation standing in the sun. Uh, it's not too bad today, but I've, I've had some hot days here at DataCon LA in the past, I will, I will admit. 
Uh, but this is what I'm showing here that you can kind of see in the background of this slide is uh, a demonstration basically of what I just was telling you about on the previous slide, where there's an application. Uh, those, uh, you can see like at the bottom of that, that picture, I know it's kind of hard to see, but you see three groupings of three nodes. Those represent three data centers. And if you were to zoom in on that photo, you would see that there's this live application that we have running. Uh, it's storing data in AWS, GCP, and Azure, one data center. Uh, in each cloud provider, um, three nodes per data center of Cassandra running. So it's a nine node cluster spread across three data centers, three different cloud providers, and you can do some pretty cool things. Um, who thinks region outage of a cloud provider never happens? <laughs> okay, that's what I thought. So uh, we're familiar with architectures in which uh, we know that we can lose nodes and we, we have commodity hardware Running, in, running on our cloud providers. We can lose a VM, we can lose a container at any time. And occasionally, yes, entire data centers go uh, down from these cloud providers. Now, I'm not throwing shade at the cloud providers. I'm not, I'm not. I'm just saying this is reality. This is distributed systems, people. Things happen, you know, backhoes hit <laughs> network trunks and boom, these things happen. So. It's great to be able to have an architecture that can spread across multiple clouds, multiple data centers. And again, Cassandra is giving us that. So that's just a little bit of background about how I think about modern architecture and microservice architecture, just so you kind of know where, I, where I'm coming from and where me, maybe where my bias is. Um, but I want to take a step back for a second and talk about how do we pick infrastructure when we're talking uh, cloud applications. And I'm thinking, obviously, as the title of my talk implies, persistence and streaming. So think like data at rest and data in motion. How are we going to get data from A to B? How are we going to store it? What are the tech? How do we decide what tech to choose for that? Uh, when I worked as an architect, these were the things I had in my head about what my job was. Notice it doesn't say boss developers around. I just want you to know that's actually one of the unwritten rules of, of the architect, but the, the overt explicit rules are that we define the components and interfaces of the system. Uh, we might identify patterns that we want developers to, to replicate. Um, the number one thing, in my opinion, is this idea of managing the illities, and that kind of goes along with this idea of managing trade-offs. And when I say illities, I'm going to expand on what I mean by that uh, in just a second. OK, now. Um, so. Uh, anybody ever seen a spreadsheet like this on one of these slides? Okay, so there's a few. There's a few of us. Okay, so here's what we used to do uh, when we wanted to select infrastructure. Now, to be fair, oftentimes we were selecting infrastructure that we knew had to live for 20 years or more. So we wanted to be very careful about these. Or, or, or maybe we were firing it into space and we weren't going to be able to touch it anymore, right? So a lot of these classic systems, these are classic systems engineering techniques. We'd select criteria for uh, the technology that we wanted, um, you know, performance characteristics, um, scalability connect characteristics, openness, uh, intang less tangible things like uh, how many vendors provide this technology so that if we need to switch, we can. Uh, we coded all these things up, created all these different weights, put them in these uh, big spreadsheets, and rated the different technologies according to each criteria, and bam, out the end of that process, popped a number which indicated the selected tool, which we all knew but didn't really like to say that we could game by changing the weights of the criteria. Okay, so I'm sorry, there was a, there was a little bit of black art that went into this. Um, this is old school enterprise IT, right? Trade studies to select tools and then we selected a tool, we write a guidance document that has a bunch of shall statements in it about what you shall and shall not do with this tool. Um, this is the way the world was and in some Way, in some places it still is. Okay, um, a funny thing started to happen uh, with the dawn of the internet age. Um, developers started realizing the kind of power that they had over technology selection and they started to use it. Um, so I, on this slide, have included two images that reflect both the positive aspects of this as well as some of the drawbacks. So uh, developers are the new king makers. This is a book out that, that uh, has been out for a number of years. Basically, the idea that developers are the ones that drive technology selection, um, not the CTO, 
uh, not the business unit manager. He might sign the check, but really a lot of these technology decisions are driven by you and I, uh, or people like you and I, our, our peers. Um, in some cases, uh, through lack of organization or organizations moving fast and breaking things, which we love, um, individual teams can sort of get a little bit out of control in terms of what they select. So you get uh, architectural diagrams like the one that you see on here where people attempt to document the crazy thing that they've created, to wiring together a bunch of new trendy infrastructure pieces. Um, and again, I'm making a caricature of a, a certain approach to architecture. But on the one hand, you might have the overly regimented styles of the past. Um, on the other side of things, you might have utter chaos and every team is absolutely doing its own thing. And nobody knows how to maintain anything because if you go to a new team, you have to learn a new stack. Has anybody ever had that? I got transferred to a new team. I just had to learn a new stack. Okay, that's no fun. Um, so. Maybe somewhere in the middle, uh, the middle road is good. Uh, so to this topic that I mentioned a few minutes ago of the ill at ease, we used to, um, <laughs> we used to have this pre-selected list of ill at ease. You may still do this, and there's still validity to this, of uh, having different architecture quality attributes that you want um, to cite. OK, so the top, the top ones are along the, are, are along the top row. So performance, scalability, availability, reliability. Um, these are the old standbys. We, we know that we want these attributes out of the infrastructure technology that we select. Um, now it can get a little bit more abstract when you start talking about extensibility. Will I be able to add things to this system? What else does it integrate with? Uh, modularity, reusability, blah, 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 blah. Sometimes we would make up illities um, just to see if anybody was watching. Uh, this is how I think about things now. At the top of the pyramid, we'll start with the most important. Uh, I think the most important is developer experience. So whatever is going to make you the most productive um, as an engineer with your team, allow you to get to market faster, that's going to be the technology that I would recommend or that, that, that I would give preference to. Uh, and then some of these other attributes that we've always looked for are still really important. Performance, availability. Uh, security is becoming more and more important, and if there was a trend chart <laughs> that I would add to this diagram, it might be that the security is kind of making its way up the chain. Um, flexibility is also, I think, a, a greatly important, and a lot of that has to do with um, that, that kind of roll, maybe that's a roll up of some of the illities that you saw on the last slide, but uh, I hear a lot of people talk about lock-in. Oh, I don't want to, okay, I'm going to go there in a second. I said it. Lock in. Um, another factor that is important but is not the most important is cost. So everyone has this dilemma of I started using the cloud provider and then I started using more and more of it and then the finance guy approached me and said, what is this giant bill that I got <laughs> that I now have to pay AWS? Um, so yes, managing cost is important, but uh, I think that it's one of several factors that goes into the decision. And a lot of times what I feel like people forget is um, time to market is a cost as well. So the, the, there are different costs that you have to balance out when you're thinking of these things. OK, uh, I don't know if anybody's seen this article. Um, it's a little bit over a year old. Um, Matt Assay, who uh, was at Adobe for a long time, and just, I found out last week, went to AWS. So he actually went over to the dark side. But I thought of, I thought of Matt as a guy that was a very objective observer of uh, open source industry. And I'm sure he still is. I'm not, I'm not trying to throw shade on that. Uh, he wrote this great article last year uh, one about what cloud lock-in. What is cloud lock-in? I'm going to get stuck with a particular cloud vendor, and I'm going to be lost, locked into their cost model. Um, the funny thing is, is that um, every, every company that is selling something um, is both afraid of lock-in as an argument that's being used against them and proactively uses lock-in as an argument against other vendors, <laughs> right? So this is the world that we live in. It's, a f it's still a FUD world, baby, uh, where, we, where we try to use those arguments. I want to kind of unpack this argument about lock-in. And, and really, what is lock-in? It's the idea that. 
I'm going to get in a situation where it's too expensive for me to change technology. I can't afford uh, the, the cost of what I'm paying the company to provide for me is going up, 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 and they're ratcheting up the costs, and they're doing it on me kind of adversarially because I, they know that as much as they're charging me and I hate it, it would actually cost me more to retool my whole stack. That's, that's sort of the, the implicit war of lock-in, right? So then that kind of the, the mature thinking behind that kind of devolves into this idea of, oh, I'm just going to say, I can't use technology X because lock-in. Okay, well, what do you really mean by that? What I think you might really mean by that is, what is the cost of change? So uh, I'm, I'm starting a crusade. Um, it hasn't gathered very much momentum just yet, but I'm still working on it. Let's stop talking about lock-in and let's start talking about cost of change and balance that against opportunity cost. Okay, so how do we minimize the cost of change? Um, everywhere I've ever been, there's been a, uh, an, uh, actually a number of companies that I've kind of come into to look over their shoulder and, and look at what they're doing. Everybody kind of does this. They want to abstract the dependence on the underlying technology. And a database is no different, and a streaming technology is no different, right? You put a little wrapper around the thing that you're talking to. You have a little wrapper around your Datastax Cassandra driver. You have a little wrapper around your Apache Kafka connector. People do these things. And this is a good architectural technique. I'm, I'm saying this is a good thing. You should abstract and, and put the, the impact of whatever technology you choose on the surface area of your application. You would like to make that as small as possible. So we do this. We build microservices that have APIs. They have core business logic, and then they have uh, data access objects or DAOs that wrap the database calls. Good technique, minimizes the cost of change. OK, so now to the meat. Uh, yes, no more sermonizing from Jeff. All right. Uh, this is how I think about choosing a database for your application. So you want to choose uh, a database that's going to have the right data model for how you want to get data out. So I'll try not to make this too abstract, but uh, a lot of times I'm not going to necessarily recommend that Cassandra is your go-to database for all of your application. You might not have enough volume for a particular type of data, and a traditional relational database might, might just be just fine for some of that kind of data. Um, a lot of people like to use caches uh, for data that they need to be accessible uh, very, very quickly and not have to go to a disk somewhere to get it. So caching is great for that uh, kind of informational data that, and document style data even sometimes that you want on your websites. Um, but if it's, it is true document unstructured data, then you probably want to use a document database like Mongo. Again, like uh, pages that uh, populating pages in your product catalog that go on your website. Um, uh, graph databases, you probably heard me talk about a little bit before. If you have data that is, uh, has a lot of relationships between it and you need to be able to kind of navigate that and you would have to do a multi-level join in order to get, uh, assemble the sort of data or follow the, the relationships in the data, then you, you may want to look into using a graph database. Um, where the sweet spot is for Cassandra is really that high volume tabular style of data uh, that's going to be larger than really can, uh, you can fit in a traditional relational database. So quick overview of Cassandra. Uh, it was first developed at Facebook. Um, it, was to be, it was intended to be used for address book uh, functionality. Um, it actually fell out of use pretty quickly um, at, uh, at Facebook, and that's part of why they were willing to open source it. Uh, but the funny thing happened, um, it got adopted as a, an Apache project and started getting more and more adoption as people found that they could use it for a variety of different use cases, uh, basically things include that required high volume of data, um, lots and lots of reads and writes with uh, very low latency, high throughput. Uh, the way that Cassandra scales is you continue to add nodes to it, and it is able to repartition your data over the nodes as you add more and more nodes to the cluster. So it scales very well. Uh, it's highly available and fault tolerant because you're storing multiple copies of your data on multiple nodes. So if a, if a node goes down, another node will have your data. Uh, and if you are designing your system well, you'll probably have to lose a lot of nodes before you actually experience any data loss. So it's, uh, it has a property. No, it does not have 
full ACID compliance in transactions in the traditional relational uh, data model sense. Um, what it does have instead is something called tunable consistency. So you can get as much consistency out of Cassandra as you ask it to. And basically there's a sliding bar where you're making a trade-off uh, between the performance and availability versus how much consistency that you want to have. Cassandra uses something called the Cassandra query language, which is similar in a lot of ways to traditional SQL, uh, but has some occasional differences here and there. So it's fairly easy for someone who has a relational background to pick up CQL and start modeling with it. So there's a bunch more that could be said um, about Cassandra. That's like, if I get one slide, I'm gonna try to tell you as much as I can in the one slide. Um, one of the ways that, that my team tries to help people um, get used to Cassandra and get, um, get up to speed on running on top of it is through a reference app. So what you see here is the user interface of uh, something that looks vaguely like YouTube. Uh, and this is an application that my team of advocates, we support this application. Uh, it's called Killer Video. And this is, a, this is built on top of Cassandra. Uh, and it also uses some of the features of DataSacks Enterprise. Specifically, there's a, that piece that says recommended for you is, what sits behind that is a graph-based recommendation engine, uh, which is pulling data from Cassandra, uh, doing some graph analytics on it, and generating recommendation results. You can uh, go online if you want to um, download this application and look at the source code. Uh, the documentation is at killervideo.github.io and then um, just github.com slash killervideo is the organization. And there's various repos underneath that that you are free to download, fork, uh, change, make PRs, make, make some changes to the project and um, join in with us on doing that. We also, um, a couple of times a week, we're uh, on Twitch where we do live coding on this application. So if you're interested in, uh, which is, it's maybe it's a gener generational thing. I never would have thought that it would be cool to watch people code. <laughs> it is. It's, it's, really, it's actually kind of mesmerizing. <laughs> so it, it's not for everyone, right? It's fine. You can have your YouTube uh, or your O'Reilly books or, you know, however you want to go about it. Um, so it's a three-tier traditional kind of application in, in the sense that there's a web app. Um, it's implemented on a couple of generations old, uh, uh, whatever the trendy uh, JavaScript was a couple of years ago. Um, we're in the process of refactoring the front end, uh, the web application to React. Um, we have implementations of the killer video services in different languages, so um, Java, C Sharp, uh, Node, and then uh, I've just been finishing up working on the Python. <laughs> there must be a, the, the Python is in bold because it's so near and dear to my heart. Um, we chose to expose service interfaces via gRPC. We could have used GraphQL or, uh, or a REST style API. Uh, what we chose was gRPC. Uh, we just finished rep ripping out etcd as a service layer, so I need to update this slide. But the most important piece is that you need to uh, learn how to use the DataSacks drivers for the different languages. And so the, each of these have uh, microservice implementations that we have in different languages, uses um, kind of like a DAO, data access object kind of pattern to uh, store and retrieve data from Cassandra um, using the DataSacks drivers. So that's the number one reason why people download these apps and look at them is because they want to learn how to use the drivers. Um, in a real world, you know, non-toy kind of example. So that's, that's the real value that I'm trying to point you to here. Um, you can actually run this a couple different ways, or at least we run it a couple different ways. Uh, you can download the application and uh, there, through a Docker Compose script, you can spin up all everything in containers. Um, we also deploy it uh, right now on AWS uh, and it's running on top of a cluster that's uh, that's, that's managed by our um, Cassandra as a service team. So we, are, we have a version of Killer Video that's deployed on top of our Cassandra as a service. Um, the way that this, uh, the way that you do data modeling in Cassandra is different. So if you're not familiar with this, you design your tables in Cassandra around specific queries. 
The reason that you do this is you, you basically you're going to insert the data in uh, use it with the way that you want to get it out in mind. Um, because Cassandra doesn't do joins and because we don't recommend creating a lot of indexes, you can create some secondary indexes, but it's not, uh, it's not something that scales as well as just having a table that supports exactly what you need. So what you see uh, on this picture is actually a diagram of all the queries that are needed by this application and how they're related to each other. And then um, the, you'll, you will <laughs> not need uh, any sort of advanced degree to, uh, once you have all those queries mapped out, to determine what underlying tables you need. It's a one-to-one -one mapping, essentially. So what ends up happening is, in the system, I know that I need to be able to find a, a user by, a, by his or her email address, so the user is going to log into the site and provide an email address. So I'm actually going to have a table that is users indexed by their email address. I might also need to get them by a unique ID because computers like unique IDs. So I, I might also have another table, which is how to get the users by a unique ID, and so on and so forth. This is a design principle known as denormalization. So I might be storing multiple copies of my data in different views. This is a way that, uh, that things work in Cassandra, and it's OK. It's something that we promote. So we design tables based on our queries. And I have a couple different uh, ways of looking at videos. On the left, I might want to get videos based on their unique ID. On the right, I might want to get them uh, based on what user uploaded them. So this is the syntax for what the CQL looks like to define each of these tables. All right, so let's talk about how we deploy these technologies. Um, there's open source Apache Cassandra, which is great. Uh, you can you know, work with it easily. You can deploy it whatever, wherever you want. Um, there's a growing set of containers and orchestration. So there is people working on Kubernetes operators for running Cassandra. Uh, DataSax provides DataSax Enterprise. We also provide that this, this kind of like the, the full version that has other integrations with other technologies. We also provide something called DataStacks Distribution of Apache Cassandra, which is just our, uh, it's basically the same as the uh, Cassandra, uh, open source Cassandra release, but with support provided. Uh, and then on the other side of things, we're actually uh, working on releasing a uh, managed service offering. 10, OK. Uh, managed service offering called Constellation that features Cassandra as a service um, and some other offerings. So you have a spectrum when you're selecting technologies. Uh, a lot of the other technologies that you could be looking at uh, will have a, a similar range of options. Open source version, enterprise version, managed service version. So you'll want to try to think through those things. Um, now, <clears throat> when you are comparing different databases, and specifically like high-scale, high-volume databases, um, Jonathan Ellis, our CTO at DataSax, has a great talk where he talks about um, some of the different scale-out databases that are out there. So specifically, it's a talk uh, about um, Cosmos DB from Microsoft uh, that they have in Azure. He also talks about Google Spanner. Um, and uh, from AWS, he talks about um, Aurora and Dynamo. Yeah, so uh, that's a good. It's a good comparison. He's very fair in, in terms of how he compares and contrasts the different architectures of those. So again, if you if you are interested in going to that talk, maybe if you have access um, to the the O'Reilly Learning platform, um, you can always go back and look at talks like this. Uh, also available on YouTube, I believe. So let's go back to this idea of uh, having a microservice architecture, and maybe you're selecting a different type of database per service. Um, one of the questions that, that I get asked sometimes is, should an individual service be polyglot? So polyglot is this idea. I'll go back for a second. Polyglot is this idea that I have different microservices that are composing my application. Each of them might have its own database that it's sitting on top of. Um, and that's, that's viewed as a positive characteristic of this style of architecture. Now, if I had an individual service that was talking to multiple databases, 
I personally would advise uh, against that. I like the idea of one service talking to one database. Um, I would wonder why you're why you were doing that. Okay. It seems overly complex to me. Um, I mean, there might be certain cases where it could work. Uh, one of the new aspects, though, that's kind of thrown a wrinkle into my thinking that I've been, been trying to work out is this idea uh, that you may have started hearing about multi-model databases. Now, the idea of a multi-model database is that it exposes different styles of data model. So it might have one underlying data store, but it's going to allow you to look at your data in different ways. Um, so there's a couple of those that are out there. Um, you may have heard some uh, uh, some marketing from DataStax in particular that we're also talking about this with respect to DataStax Enterprise. The idea is that can I make my database look like if it's, uh, let's say it's Cassandra, could I get key value sem semantics out of it to make it look like a key value store? Well, you could. Um, could I get it to look like a document database where I put in uh, JSON and get, get out JSON? Um, you can sort of, but it's not really uh, schemaless in the same way that MongoDB is. So you can, sometimes you can get uh, different types of database to, to look like each other, but obviously every database is going to have its own internal model that's like the purest form of how it represents data. So I do think this idea of a multi-model database is something that can work, but I think you also need to look at the details and, and have uh, appropriate expectations about what, how flexible that data model is, or how, how good of a job each database does about doing a data model that is not its core data model. So I want to switch over at this point to talking about streaming. How do we get data around? Um, so I've been working a lot with Kafka lately um, in some of my dev work on killer video. Um, so Kafka is has gained a lot of popularity over the past couple of years as a uh, you know, distributed streaming framework. Um, it turns out to have actually a lot of the same architectural principles um, as Cassandra. And I think that's why you actually find them used quite frequently together. Um, they, they are both distributed systems. They both rely on multiple nodes. You uh, expand or scale them out by adding uh, additional nodes. In the Kafka world, they're called brokers. Um, but they have a lot of that similar architectural uh, capability where they're organized in clusters. Uh, if you lose a particular node, you can survive the loss of that node. They scale really well. They scale across data centers. Um, there's a number of things that Kafka provides that make it start to look like a database, although I would argue I'm not sure that it's, it's quite the same as a database, but it has some database-like behaviors. For example, uh, the case equal where you can actually, um, through the Kafka <coughs> streaming framework, so it has a, a connect framework that you can plug in. Uh, you can also build applications that um, query data uh, as if it's a database uh, using KSQL. So Kafka, uh, whereas in uh, Cassandra, you have the con concept of partitions, the parallel concept in Kafka is called topics. So uh, you have, I'm sorry, in Cassandra you have tables, and in Kafka you have topics. But th these are organizations of related data. So it's organized as a key value data model. Um, it's append only, and the topics can be partitioned. So in that way, it's similar to Cassandra in which you can have a partitioning of data across multiple. Um, Kafka also has a concept of producers that are generating events and consumers that are consuming events on these topics. And each one, one cool thing about Kafka is that each consumer can have a, uh, its own offset to where it's looking into this persistent um, queue of data, basically. There's also the concept of a stream application, which is a combined producer and consumer. So what it does is consumes the data, perform a transformation, and then write into some other topics. And then uh, if you are writing a stream application, you can use that KSQL query language. So it's a very powerful framework, and a lot of what it's doing is helping you move data around and transform it as it's in motion. So 
So Cassandra and, and Kafka, let's compare and contrast for a second. They're both distributed systems. They both do uh, partitioning based on hashing algorithms. So they, how they decide what nodes to send your data to is based on a partition key or a hashing key. Um, they do both replicate data, so multiple copies of your data are available uh, within, within these clusters uh, for high availability. They both scale very well across data centers. They both use uh, an append-only or log-structured storage model, which is very advantageous for performance and scalability. Um, and they both, al both also have a capability called uh, time to live, so that you can allow data to naturally expire out of the system as it gets old. And we find a lot of applications where this is, these kind of behaviors are really useful. So Cassandra is great at uh, high volume, write intensive data storage. Uh, it's, it's suitable as your primary database or system of record. Um, and then there is an the ability to do searching on data in Cassandra that we provide in our DataStacks Enterprise product. Kafka is really good at streaming um, data to and from services um, two legacy sources, two maybe two anal two uh, databases where it's going to be data is going to be analyzed for analytic purposes. So it's great for ETL applications, for example, um, and it's great uh, in terms when you have data sources that might be changing at different rates. Uh, it's very good at being able to build applications that that handle that, ingest that data, produce some output, and then you might choose to store it in Cassandra. And that's actually the patterns that I want to share. Uh, there's just a couple of simple patterns that we see used again and again. Um, the first pattern is the idea that there's a producer that's generating some events. Uh, it's a producer into Kafka generating one or more topics. You might have a microservice that is a consumer of that topic. It's going to consume from one or more Kafka topics. Um, it's going to store some of that data uh, in, into Cassandra um, and then it might also, as a result of doing that, that data transformation, publish to another topic. So uh, we see this a lot. This is what actually the killer video application does, uh, is that when a new user is created, a, a new user event is generated, and then we actually consume that event, store it into a graph database that we can then query later for recommendations. So that's the example I actually advanced made my slide one, <laughs> one sentence too late. Um, that's the, basically the pattern here is we have services that generate events for when users are created or videos are added or, or, or rated. Um, and then there's another service called suggested video service that consumes from those topics and writes data into the graph for the graph recommender to process. The second pattern is uh, one in which we are going to be using uh, Cassandra as our system of record to store data. So uh, a lot of times people uh, will keep data in Kafka for a little while, uh, but if they want to store it kind of in a more permanent fashion, um, they might want to actually uh, consume, use, basically um, use uh, Cassandra as a sink for data that's in one or more Kafka topics. So we actually have a, um, DataStacks Apache, Apache Kafka connector that stores data. So just to summarize um, some of the points that we've been making, uh, it's good to use microservice architectures. It's good to use polyglot persistent approaches in which you choose uh, the right database for each microservice. You should select the, those databases based on what you need uh, performance and scalability wise out of each of those services. So Use Cassandra if it's the right one. Use Mongo if it's the right one. Uh, use whatever database is right for that microservice, keeping in mind how things are going to scale over time. Um, use queuing technologies or streaming technologies like Kafka to control data synchronization. Um, I really like Kafka, and I do highly recommend that for kind of moving data around. Uh, and then, yes, best practice is to use those abstraction layers, use data access objects, et cetera so that you are avoiding the, the dreaded lock-in, or as I like to say, minimizing your cost of change. All right. Um, so just 
by way of um, sharing where you can learn more, Data Sacks Academy is all free training. It's very popular. This is how uh, many, if not most people, tend to learn Cassandra is by going and taking our free courses. Uh, we also have courses about some of the more advanced workloads um, that are available. Um, probably the most popular course is the Cassandra Data Modeling course, DS220. So a lot of people learn Cassandra Data Modeling that way. And there is a short course about the Kafka connector that I mentioned in this talk. Um, I mentioned the Twitch. I already know that I have one naysayer. Uh, <laughs> but I expect to see many more followers uh, on our Twitch channel after this. So. Uh, and this is another one of those, if you want to get grab a photo of the slide, uh, this is kind of like the comprehensive list of the um, Kafka connector in terms of documentation, training, example code that you can look at, um, and, the, and a blog post that kind of ties it all together. So that is all I have. I don't know if I have time for questions or not, or if you want to accost me in the hallway. I welcome that. <laughs> all right, thank you.